Welcome to the City Forum podcast, recorded as part of the City Forum Intelligence Defence Series. Following on from the release of City Forum's annual report, Maximising Smart Power and Public Value, General Sir Jack Deverell, Associate of City Forum, formerly Commander of NATO Joint Force Headquarters, and Professor Paul Cornish, Chief Strategist at City Forum and Visiting Professor at LSE Ideas, the foreign affairs think tank at the London School of Economics, so Jack and Paul will be discussing national strategy, predicting the unpredictable. If you'd like to order a copy of the report and find out more, please visit www.cityforum.co.uk. This conversation on national strategy and understanding the role and value of armed force uh, coincides with the publication of Maximising Smart Power and Public Value, the latest report by City Forum in its Intelligent Defence series. The report covers uh, many, many themes in the current international security and defence debate, and there's, in that respect ought to be of interest to everybody, really, who's involved in those um, issues in the media and politics and academia and so on. But it should be a, of a special interest to those who are to be involved in the impending UK National Security and Defence Review. Uh, it is often thought that the first duty of the state is to protect its citizens um, and it has been uh, seen as best achieved by defending the interests of those citizens. Um, uh, one, one of the rules of lessons of history uh, is that conflict, conflict is best kept at arm's length. Um, you don't want to fight your adversary on your own territory because your own territory gets damaged almost certainly uh, and this particularly for an island race has led uh, this country consistently to intervene outside their national boundaries um, and uh, this has led us to uh, a rather more perhaps a rather more global attitude or one of the reasons that this country's had a more global attitude than some of its European um, neighbours. But there is a basic requirement to defend the state and the citizens of the state from both external and internal threats. Over the past uh, generation, there has been a massive expansion of the nature of those threats. Um, you've had the terrorism, which has been uh, often um, uh, the, the source of which has often been non-state actors, sometimes at the behest of state adversaries of this country or the Western Alliance or the West uh, um, in general. Uh, you have the impending possibility of space itself becoming uh, a, future, a future battleground and you have the ever-present and current uh, threat of uh, cyber attack. Um, and, and that cyber attack, of course, interestingly enough, uh, is uh, often focused not on military or state infrastructure, but on that which supports it, the financial um, system, um, interference in elections, interference in uh, government decision-making, uh, manipulation of uh, special... Uh, focus and special interest groups uh, to the benefit of um, adversaries or, or merely to the detriment of our, our um, governmental systems. Defending, of course, uh, normally implies some form of offensive action because part of, part of the formula to uh, maintain the security of your citizens and your interests and your uh, your um, your country, the, the geographical uh, element of your country, uh, is deterrence, which a protection itself uh, may not achieve. Uh, some form of sanction is always there, inherent, uh, in our capability to wage offensive action. So the importance of deterrent uh, remains uh, uh, crucial. Uh, we see this, of course, uh, with things like the um, our nuclear deterrent. But what about cyber? 
Are we capable uh, and is it in our interest to take the battle to the adversary? Uh, and if not, where is the deterrence value? Are we merely protecting or are we defending? One of the advantages of uh, a broad-based defensive capability, which spans from, let us say, cyber to conventional operations, is it gives politicians choice. Because the armed forces have the ability, uh, in a way which uh, almost no other arm of the state does, to engage in both soft and hard power. The soft uh, is self-evident, it might be merely presence, it might be a cocktail party, it might be support of uh, commercial ventures, uh, it might be reassurance. It is often practical help delivered uh, during times of national emergency, earthquake, plague, Ebola, uh, whatever. But the difference is that that soft power can relatively quickly and, uh, uh, and extremely effectively be turned into hard power to cope with essentially dynamic and high-risk situations. Paul, what, what's your view on that assessment? Uh, thank you, Jack. The discussion of soft and hard power, I think, is is particularly interesting and important, and, and the latest uh, uh, variations of it, um, smart power and sharp power and all these sorts of things. The, the, the soft and hard power idea was the brainchild of Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard. Uh, and he made, as well as the analysis that you've just been giving, he made one other point, which I think is, is, is important to bear in mind. He said that um, soft par power is about having these, these different tools available and using them as appropriate to the circumstances, but it's also about using the resources that are available. And I think this, this is a key point. Um, and I, I put it in this rather crude way. You know, a lot of people tend to think that if you're clever enough to think about soft and hard power, that somehow allows you to reduce your spending on the, hard, the expensive hard power stuff, uh, because you've also got access to relatively inexpensive soft power stuff such as communications and uh, BBC World Service and so on and so forth. Joseph Nye makes pretty much the opposite point. He says this is not a, this is not a means to reduce spending. It still requires resources. And that, that takes me back to the first point you made, Jack, if I may. Um, the, the argument that the first duty of the state is to protect the citizen is... is it is is such a powerful one, um, and it is writ large. And we hear it so many times, don't we, from uh, politicians and so on, quite rightly, when they begin debating defence matters. It's a, a really valid starting point. It comes, well, it was articulated more or less in those words by Adam Smith, um, perhaps surprisingly. Uh, there was this great um, liberal free market economist making this, this key point. He also, though, went on to say... Uh, that while this is the first duty, there is, in a sense, a first duty before that one, <laughs> which is that defence um, costs money, but at no point must it be allowed to distort the economy or uh, you can't have massive overspending on defence if it actually destroys your economy. That would make no sense. So I've always argued that there is a kind of a prior obligation before you can get to the first duty, which is you mustn't spend too much money on it. Clearly, you must spend some on it, but not not too much. Um, uh, so and I think it's what I'm coming to there really is this, the eternal balancing act between um, strategy, interest, obligations, and resources. And it, 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 it goes all the way through it. And it certainly does still apply in the hot, soft and hard power debate. Could I, if I could um, just pick up one other um, point in your opening remarks, Jack, which is concerned with um, cyber security and cyber deterrence. There happens to be something I'm doing some work on at the moment. Um, th there's a lot of thinking going into, into this at, at present. How do we deter in cyberspace? Um, and, and quite a lot of that discussion almost uh, naturally defaults to Cold War style deterrence. There have been some people who have said, look, it, we got it sorted out in the 40s and 50s. We thought hard and we produced mutual strategic nuclear deterrence. So surely... Uh, we can take those models and transplant them to the cyber era, or at the very least, if we did it then, then we'll do something nowadays that's, that's similar. Uh, 
uh, it, this worries me because having looked at it, I don't, I'm not sure that there's very much in the Cold War experience that is translatable to the um, to the cyber era because it's very difficult to establish who your adversary is, what they want, and what they're prepared to risk. Indeed, it's difficult to establish whether they've whether they've even attacked you when they have. So there's all sorts of complications we have to bear in mind, and th- and that's why I come to the um, the point of uh, resilience in a way, which I think is is part of your point about uh, protecting versus external and internal threats and indeed hazards. It seems to me that the most that we can expect uh, in cyber deterrence is to is to protect our systems uh, as best we can. Um, if we can do that, if we can protect what we best know, the way that we use IT and so on, then we're probably giving ourselves the advantage and the initiative that the adversary, whoever they are, whatever they want, whenever they're attacking you, cannot possibly know as well as you are. So it comes, for me, to a point of to do with, with resilience of our own systems. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I mean, interesting, this uh, this difference between the attitude to deterrence uh, based on the, the Cold War and, and pre-Cold War um, uh, attitudes as well. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the bomber Free 1939, uh, the, the, one of the Royal Air Force uh, justifications of, of the bomber fleet was that it would deter um, our adversary, essentially Germany, from uh, uh, bombing us if we could bomb them. So deterrence itself, I think, is seen by some people as, 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 as a Cold War issue, but of course it has existed uh, since uh, a man first armed himself with a heavier sword than, the, than, than his of, uh, um, adversary. Uh, I'd like now just to talk about understanding the role of the armed forces because it strikes me that there is a growing mismatch between uh, the understanding that the armed forces have of their role and the understanding that the community at large has of their role. Uh, we are in a sort of paradoxical situation, I think, at the moment, where the armed forces are one of the most respected institutions in the country, or certainly have been over the past few years, and yet there seems to be a growing separation between uh, the understanding of what the armed forces stand for and what they do, and the society which reveres them. Uh, it's, uh, it's a strange phenomena. Uh, but uh, and whether this is because there is a growing sense in society of individual rights, um, the the whole business of uh, running your life as you would run it, the diminution of concepts of service and duty, uh, all these things appear to be running in in one direction uh, within the community at large. And perhaps I'm I'm making. A, a rather gross uh, simplification there, uh, uh, whereas in the armed forces there is still very strongly held the sense of service and duty and selfless commitment and, and all those values which are admired by people but they don't seem to want to join them somehow and there is a problem, uh, and will continue to be a problem over recruiting and, and retention uh, because of this uh, what appears to be growing Gulf, and I wonder what your views on that might be. I agree with everything you've just said, um, Jack, and I think you made one extremely important point, which is that the armed forces know their role very well, and I couldn't agree more. Um, they do. They spend a lot of time thinking about what they might do and preparing for it. They really do know what they're there for, um, and maybe that's part of the reason why, they, why we keep giving them more roles to take on, uh, because they're so good at adapting. Um, But one interesting contribution to one of our discussions um, was to suggest that there is a complete lack of understanding, as you were hinting, among the public, and especially in the, let's call it the post-Cold War generation, as to what the armed forces are actually there for. Now, if that's even half true, then it would seem that the the defensive view that's about to happen might be proceeding on a massive and very unreliable assumption that people understand what this is all about. Uh, if the public are, really are so unaware and so 
ill-informed, if you like, and so uninterested in the role of armed force, if they've got no knowledge of, of the risks associated with the deployment of armed force on this or that type of operations, then it seems to me that politicians uh, and strategists will surely find it ever harder to, to give any sort of leadership in this matter. Who, who are they talking to? And what would be the basis, the respectable basis of any decisions that they make? Um, and this leads me to another uh, question, which is included in the report, um, which is to ask how confident we can be that the UK has, uh, in quotes, the will to fight. A rather straightforward, if not rather brutal question, but it's a really important one to ask. Does the UK have the will to fight? Um, now, I, I also say that in the course of our discussion, several other people took a very different view, arguing that there is actually a good underpinning level of understanding about what the armed forces do and what they're for, but it is not encouraged and cultivated sufficiently by our strategic leadership, not communicated well enough and so on. Um, if, I, if I can go on just for a second, just to say that it, it does seem to me that the way the armed forces contribute to national resilience, picking up the, the theme that we were discussing a few minutes ago, seems to me to be an increasingly important function as part of this, this um, if you call it, out, you might call it an outreach task. I, I think resilience is critical to the public understanding of, of what was described in one of our meetings as the psychological construct of national security. If, a society, if as a society we don't feel resilient uh, then and robust, then we probably don't feel secure. Uh, and that's quite an impor important test, I think. So the conclusion that I came to on the role of armed forces as far as resilience is concerned, um, or rather that the report came to, is that if, if we um, deploy the armed forces on um, res civic resilience tasks, such as um, uh, flood relief, uh, transport assistance and so on, then it's important, I think, that these should be portrayed as civil assistance operations rather than a military operation but without weapons. I think this is a really important thing to do. But by the same token, what must be done at the same time, very usefully, very positively, is to show that the, the military skills, uh, and right down to very low levels, uh, very low, you'll know far better than I do, Jack, just how good 21-year-old young soldiers are at assessment, at planning and at communication, and indeed as being part of a command and control system. All of these skills, I think, can all be very valuable um, and can be shown to be valuable outside a standard military context. I think what is uh, fascinating there is the, the points you've just touched on. Uh, and I recall the uh, uh, extraordinary um, response of the public to the soldiers who were at very short notice put on security duty at the Olympics. Uh, something which was created as, as we will remember because uh, the commercial firm uh, were, uh, had failed to, uh, to, to deliver that which they had said they would deliver. And uh, soldiers were called up at very short notice. And the relationship between the soldiers and the crowd, uh, and remember that crowd was an international crowd, was quite extraordinary uh, and it did the army an enormous amount of good uh, because the army came out uh, i say the army the the armed forces because it was a it was a joint service issue uh, the the armed forces came out as a beacon of excellence they were not only highly efficient they were highly human in a way which in in many ways security guards um are not they're almost, they almost have it trained out of them. Uh, that's a generalisation. John Keegan famously said once that that which kept the British Army honest was its intense local links. This was many years ago, he said it. Their intense local links. Because the, local, uh, the, the locality felt the shame when things went wrong and were proud when things went right. And the soldiers went back, back to their locality and felt that pride or that shame. And he, one of, one of his justifications of the regimental system was 
that sort of balancing which was created by intense local uh, connections. And of course that is one of the things that the breakdown of the regimental system and the, the, the um, reduction, the dramatic reduction in size of the army has undermined. Uh, the army in particular uh, has not helped itself by going into the super garrisons for very sensible administrative and financial reasons. But we are now located in very, very few areas of the country uh, who probably suffer too much army, and yet there are substantial areas of the country, very substantial areas, that have no army at all. And I think that helps, uh, or, or doesn't help, uh, b because it, it tends to uh, to confirm in people's view that the army is something that